Welcome to Om Times TV, a division of Om Times Media and Broadcasting. Welcome to What is Going Om for new thought from the edge of Om. Each week on Om Times flagship radio show, veteran broadcaster, author, and media consultant Sandy Sedgbeer conducts thought-provoking interviews with inspirational authors, artists, musicians, scientists, speakers, and filmmakers who are working at the point where spirituality and science meet consciousness at the very edge of Om. Here is your host, Sandy Sedgbeer. Hello. Here's an interesting question to ponder. Has psychiatry lost its mind? According to this week's guest, the answer is indubitably. Jerry M. Cantor is a faculty member of the Ontario College of Homeopathic Medicine and owner of Vital Force Healthcare LLC, a Boston area homeopathic and acupuncture practice. The first acupuncturist to receive an academic appointment at Harvard Medical School's Department of An Anesthesiology. He is the author of several books, including Interpreting Chronic Illness, The Toxic Relationship Cure, Autism Reversal to Toolbox, and the one we'll be discussing today, Sane Asylums, The Success of Homeopathy Before Psychiatry Lost Its Mind, in which he reveals the astonishing but suppressed history of homeopathic psychiatry. Jerry Cantor, welcome. Thank you, Sandy. Such a pleasure to be here again. Sane Asylums reveals that in the late 1800s and early 1900s, homeopathy was regarded with far more respect than it's been given in recent years. I was shocked to discover that there were over 100, uh, 1,000 homeopathic pharmacies 100 homeopathic hospitals, 22 homeopathic medical schools, and thousands of documented successful outcomes in treating mental illness. So what happened? Well, that's a big question. <clears throat> many, many things happened. Um, well, the Flexner Report in 1910 was, was a one, one big problem. Uh, when I was Growing up, I was always told uh, that the Flexner Report modernized medicine, brought everything into uh, up to standard and sort of cleaned house. But the truth of the matter is that uh, it was a disaster for homeopathy and for um, you know many natural natural therapies, including Thompsonianism, herbal therapy, Native American medicine. Um, yeah, Rockefeller and his minions, you know, and Andrew Carnegie cleared the field for their um, petrochemical related uh, drugs that were patentable. They could make patents on it. So they, they cleared the field and, and denigrated all these other kinds of medicine, created medical schools that uh, um, made, made no room for homeopaths. It, just, uh, it, was, it was an amazing, an amazing agenda. And bit by bit, um, homeopathy became displaced. Many other things happened. I mean, the, 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 the asylums that I wrote about, which were, which were hugely successful and powerful, um, they failed due to their own success. They wound up becoming overpopulated. With uh, the, the quality of the staff went down. Um, they became, you know, warehouses. But in general, the moral care movement that was uh, dominating um, mental health care started to erode, and the old old abuses came back. Started treating treating the mentally ill as as uh, people that just needed to be warehoused or medicated. And uh, homeopaths lost control. Of of uh, of their own of their own facilities, and um, yeah, they went went through a, a very tough time after 1910. I, I think of 1910 quite a bit. That's the year that uh, William James died. He was uh, an amazing um, psych psychologist um, whose idea of thinking about you know um, his idea of prag pragmatism, his idea of, of of process involved in uh, taking taking into account someone's. The, the process narrative in, in someone's life, the fact that things change all the time and his pragmatic orientation, um, his, his death was a big deal as far as I'm concerned. It was also the time when eugenics uh, took hold in this country. 
um, mm. completely distorting the view of how you looked at not, not just mentally ill people, but all kinds of ill people. Um, and homeopaths themselves uh, fell victim to the pressures from the, from the, from the pharmaceutical industry. And uh, people like um, Frank Richardson in, in, in uh, New York, I'm sorry, in the Boston area, succumbed and became, uh, um, you know, betrayed their own professions, turning on it for the sake of, of, of just getting, getting money to run these, these research facilities that uh, had a scientific orientation, so-called scientific orientation, which uh, required denigrating homeopathy. It was just ridiculous things happened. Anyway, mm. homeopathy went through a, a dark period, and uh, it's, 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 it's in some places it never really it, it never really was killed. I mean, England had had you know a strong history of, of using homeopathy for quite some time, but in this country, uh, it gradually the, the the message came to be that it's outmoded, that it's old fuddy duddy medicine, that uh, nobody cares about it, and and then people started censoring on their own. Uh, a little book came out from uh, Johns Hopkins Press. Uh, homeopathy, uh, uh, medical story of a medical heresy. So Johns Hopkins has been promoting this idea that homeopathy was a heresy, was a sect, very unimportant, and it's taken taken root. So that in the in the academic world, it's this the history that uh, I wrote about in Saint Asylum is simply not not there. It's absolutely absent, um, which is a terrible shame because of the 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 dribble down effect of that is that uh, you know, it's not when something's not taught anywhere, people start to believe that it it, it didn't exist. Censorship is an awful thing. Um, yeah. I want to quote something that you had in the book. You, you said that the moral care movement emerged as a therapeutic approach that emphasized kindness with an intent to restore and build character. It derived from revulsion for existing barbaric treatment spiritual and moral concern, as well as from the field of psychiatry's gradual concession that mental illness is often curable. When you look at the state of the mental health today, when, you know, the statistics are through the roof, why are we not looking at this? I mean, it seems to be such, you know, such a kinder treatment and more effective. Yeah, follow the money. I'm afraid, Sandy. Just follow the money. It's so much easier to to uh, medicate people, pretend that uh, wow, this is great. We've killed uh, institutionalization. People are out in their communities, but of course, we know that in the communities they're zombies. Uh, they're very diminished, and um, not. And then there are all these side effects from these famous medicines that have have been um, foisted on this population. We have conditions like tardive dyskinesia, which never existed before. We have five kinds of bipolar bi bipolarity. Uh, I mean, I look at the DSM volumes, um, uh, Diagnostic Statistical Manuals of, of Mental Health, and I, I, I would laugh if it wasn't so sad. One of the conditions is uh, medication-induced anxiety. That's uh, one of the conditions, as if that was <laughs> – you know, everybody was born to have to be you know, on, be on medications. I mean, that industry mm -hmm. was perfectly happy if every single person was, was an outpatient. Um, so how are people responding to your book, you know, psychiatrists and colleagues? There's quite a paradigm division. Um, it's very little in between. Either you get this or you don't. It is being sold because, uh, remarkably, I have a good publisher uh, who's, you know, stuck their neck out and said, well, you know, there has been a kibosh on, on homeopathic books. Even uh, uh, places like Elsevier and Team and, and Springer, which used to publish homeopathic medical texts, you know, they caved to the pressure from the pharmaceutical industry, again, saying, you know, painting this medicine as, as irrelevant. And uh, they just stopped publishing these books. And in England, the campaign against homeopathy has been strong. In Australia, it's been strong. Um, so these books are not appearing. Um, and so my publisher, uh, Inner Traditions, I, I think did a, a fairly brave thing. I, I argued that, look, this is not another homeopathy book. Just the fact that it has homeopathy in the title will not be a deal, deal killer. And it addresses the reason why homeopathy is in, has been kiboshed. So please bring it out. Um, people who read it are absolutely astonished. They say, I never knew this. And I say, well, <laughs> that's why it had to be written. You have to fight, a pre you have to fight suppression of information. It's a very bad thing. Um, Anyway, the, the, the mental health crisis is so severe now that I think people are starting to look at this and, and, and uh, people who might never have considered it are, are taking it seriously. 
But money drives everything. Homeopathic remedies are not patented. So there's not much money to be made apart from actually dealing with people, looking at them, listening to their stories, and, and selecting a remedy carefully, when it's so much easier to just put them in a certain category. You know, you're bipolar one, two, or three. You're psychotic. You're psychotic. You're schizoid. Take this, take that. And we'll deal with the side effects later. Oh, you've got the heart of tardive dyskinesia. You're, you're shaking like crazy and you can't even speak. We'll deal with that. So people have the idea that nothing. there's no alternative. So my message has been when you suppress information, there's a, there's a, there's a consequence. There's something you, you, really, you really wind up paying, pay, paying for that later on. The loss of choice that has come from the suppression of this information has been devastating. And so that's a drum I've been beating for quite some time. Um, and just getting people acquainted with this. This is not, this is not trivial. This is not, this is not unimportant. The fact that remedies belong to everyone, just like acupuncture points belong to everyone. Nobody has a right to own them. Doesn't mean that they're insignificant, but we have been brainwashed as a society to believe that unless something makes money, it's not, it's not genuine or it's worthwhile. Um, I can talk about this forever, but many of us know this on one level that the perverse incentives in the pharmaceutical industry are, 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 are horrible. Um, they just drive us in the wrong direction. But people should know there is a choice. Yeah. Homeopathy yeah. is a little bit slower. It is slower because you have to really get to know someone in their entirety. Uh, it's not diagnosis-driven. We use these terms as, a, as an entry point um, to get a sense of what's going on. But the differences between people matter much, much more than the commonality. Uh, so it's a huge paradigm uh, gap. Um, in the conventional world, the idea of normalcy implies that everybody is the same. And there's some devi- any deviation from that normality, abnormality, is path- pathological. In homeopathy, it's it's kind of the opposite. Um, every everyone is every the, the the differences between matter much much more than the commonalities. You and I have the same number of organs. We're roughly the same shape, um, uh, same kind of uh, physiology. But that's unimportant as far as figuring out what's going on with you, what issue at the, at, at the very, ex, what existential issue in you is, is setting the table for your chronic illness, whatever, whatever you, you get. So homeopaths, to, to enter into the spiritual aspect of this conversation, homeopathy is spiritual forensics. If we can figure out what's going on in somebody existentially, which does not mean at the conscious level, subconsciously, what, what, is, driving the, uh, what is driving this person that can take them into, into, into a dangerous waters, you know, that can be addressed with a homeopathic remedy. They have, as we'll talk about in the second half of the show, I think, the existential issues that are embedded within chronic illness conditions. But yeah. homeopaths have always known that. It's not even something we talk about. It's just so, it's just so automatic, uh, and yet that, uh, you know, in our practice. Um, but it's a, r- a radical during, idea in conventional medicine. During the pandemic, I mean, there was quite a lot of um, material going around about how homeopathy was used in the 1917 pandemic with great statistically you know measured yeah, success yeah, yeah. um so i think a lot of more people got exposed to the idea of um homeopathy are you finding that it is beginning to enjoy a bit of a resurgence i am as busy as hell i am incredibly busy and i'm i it's partly a function of just you know getting the message out and having these these podcast interviews people who get it they really do get it uh, the people who who don't, who have some idea, people have many, many mistaken ideas about homeopathy to the extent to which they know the word. Some of them think that it's a, a, a synonym for anything gentle. That's not the case. Two other words start with H, herbs and holistic me- holistic medicine. Well, homeopathy is absolutely holistic, but there are many things that are holistic that are not homeopathic. Um, yeah. Remedies can be made from botanicals and you know, herbs, but they can be made from many, many other things too. So people, p- p- part of the problem has been the mischaracterization and the, the deliberate misinformation that's been spread about homeopathy. Uh, so they don't, they don't really know what it is. The idea of using like to cure like, um, that is something that needs to be taught. That's a law of nature. Um, I didn't invent that. No homeopath invented it. It's just something that's absolutely true. If you get back on the horse that threw you, that's better than ever getting back on a horse and finding your, your terror uh, you know, entrenched. It is really something almost as simple as that. You don't need a double-blind, uh, uh, you know, research protocol to prove that getting back on the horse to throw you is a good idea. You have to face your demons. You have to re-encounter the original source of your trauma that has led to your condition in order to get past it. And that is not a, a quick fix. If you want a quick fix and you're absolutely centered on that, 
don't go to homeopathy. Just continue doing what you're doing and uh, reap what you're going to sow. If you want to deal with your illness at a deep level, find out, not only get better, but find out why you become sick. Well, then you have to enter into this arena and, and uh, engage with what homeopaths like to do, which is investigate your life stories. Interestingly, in, a, I mean, in the conventional world, they are now starting to talk about how you know, storytelling is really a window into someone. It's beginning to get, you know, get some traction. But this has been <laughs> long established in homeopathy for such a long time. And in the asylums that I write about, in, uh, in, in insane asylums, the, the nurses and the doctors took their time to learn someone's history and prescribe for their situation. Well, just being listened to can often help someone tremendously without anything else, any other yes, thing. That's right. Yeah. And I have found that when I just tell the when I explain the remedy and its deep theme in terms of their life, you know, something profound comes over the client. Yes, as as you say, just on being being heard and and resonating with what the remedy is about often initiates the processing of the remedy well before you even take it by mouth. Yeah. So when did um, homeopathy start being used in psychiatry? I mean, was that always always a thing or was it something that emerged after, you know, people were aware of homeopathy? Well, from the very beginning, um, there, was no, there was no problem with a mind-body distinction. You, you, <laughs> you had to take the mentally and emotional physical characteristics of someone in taking their case. So it always so touched it on psychiatry. Always part of it. I'll tell you this, Sandy, you know, in China, um, when they, the West tried to introduce psychiatry to the tr traditional Chinese doctors, they couldn't understand it. They just laughed. What are you talking about? We already have that. It's already ingrained in our traditional medicine. And the, the psychiatrists had the devil of a time trying to convince the Chinese that something like psychiatry was a separate discipline. And uh, I guess, the, you know, as I say, with the, 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 the momentum of con conventional pharmaceutical medicine that has that has won won quite a few people over, but the but the traditional Chinese doctors so that's, that's ridiculous. We have no need for that. Our our acupuncture uh, treatments and our, our our herbal treatments they absolutely take into account uh, what you're talking about. We don't need a separate discipline for that. So yeah, if you look at homeopathic textbooks, the mind section on a remedy in Materia Medica is very very extensive. And we're constantly looking at, at ways to refine our understanding of the themes of, of, of the remedies and categorizing them. And that's something that I've, I've really made a big effort to do in my second, the second book we'll be talking about. Mm -hmm. So there's many, many, if you, if you take a word like anxiety or depression and you show that to a homeopath, my God, we'll have 50 times of kinds of, de of anxiety to talk about with depression, 50, 60 kinds of depression and getting really into that into that term, what exactly that's about. It's, it's, as, as a generic term, it's not that useful. So anyway, to answer your question, um, psychiatry was not needed as a separate discipline in the early days of homeopathy. But I will say this, Samuel Hahnemann, the founder of homeopathy, was the very first physician in the world uh, to, to treat anyone in an asylum uh, using, using homeopathy. He was the first. And uh, it's a famous case of uh, treating this, this nobleman in, 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 in what's now called Germany, Klockenbring, who was completely out of his mind. And Hahnemann did it uh, by observing him very carefully over a period of time and then prescribing this particular remedy. Well, so, you say in your book, I mean, there's some very interesting um, chapters in there. You say that uh, Abraham Lincoln's wife was treated successfully at a sane asylum. Yeah, now that's going to, if, if people read that, I hope that prompts a lot of discussion. Um, again, the politics of this are very interesting. Um, his physician was not officially a homeopath. Uh, her, her physician, rather, at, at the, in this Illinois um, uh, sanitarium that Mary Todd Lincoln went to. It was a very famous trial, um, a spectacular trial for that time. It was written about everywhere. Her son, Robert Lincoln, uh, maintained that she had lost her mind. She was spending uh, pro pro uh, prodigiously. She had all kinds of incredible delusions. She thought cities were on fire that were not. She thought that she was being invaded by electricity. I mean, it, anyway, there were many, many testimonials about her that she was completely out of her mind. Um, Fourteen doctors testified. Um, and anyway, she was found uh, incurably insane by this particular trial. And uh, 
a number of the physicians who, who were homeopaths said, you know, send her to this guy, Richard Patterson in, in Illinois. And they kind of winked and winked. I said, he's, he's, he's got a reputation. They didn't say why, but the, even the homeopath said, see this guy. The guy was not officially a homeopath, but I have lots of information uh, indicating that this, this is pr pr pretty much what he used. And they can, so there are two narratives about Mary Todd Lincoln, and none of them make sense. One was that, well, she was never crazy in the first place. Um, she just needed some uh, rest and relaxation. And the other one was, uh, well, yeah, yeah, she was she was crazy, but um, the lawyers got her out of there, and uh, that, that's what sort of what accounts of it. The what I think actually happened was that she was treated by homeopathy at this uh, uh, this uh, sanitarium. And within three months, she was perfectly fine. She was writing letters to, to her family. She was uh, petitioning to get herself out of there. She was having convivial conversations with Richard Patterson's family. Um, but you know, uh, back in those days, there you know you saw you saw the statistics on how many homeopathic hospitals there were. Many many hospitals practiced homeopathy, had homeopaths on their staff, but didn't call themselves officially homeopathic hospitals. There was no need to do that. The overlap between the two kinds of doctors was very substantial. But the political gap was big. If you called yourself one thing or another, you know, that, that really relegated you to one crowd. But before patented medicines, physicians had a lot of control over how much of a substance was, went into their, into, their, into their prescriptions. And conventional medicines were constantly thinking they, they, they made some huge discoveries by playing with the dilution of the substance, thinking that they made a great discovery not, and not giving homeopaths any credit because we've been doing that for centuries. That's how you make a powerful remedy, by diluting it, not by making it stronger. So the overlap was substantial. And this guy, Patterson, was very, very clever. He covered his tracks. And um, the homeopaths knew that he had the secret weapon. And that's why they referred Mary Todd Lincoln to him. Mm. But this story has he, never been told. I think it's a 150-year-old uh, journalistic coup. <laughs> um, I liked the, um, the uh, segments on um, Selden Talcott who yes. um, you say was arguably the greatest psychiatrist America has not known, <laughs> and his uh, approach to treating mental illness and other conditions such as chronic drunkenness were, you know, quite um, ingenious in many cases. I mean, he introduced <laughs> baseball yes. into psychiatric care and, yes. and other natural therapies as well. Yes. I mean, he was... a. Uh... As a homeopath, he was not that different from a lot of the other well-trained homeopaths who came out. He was a Civil War physician, just a very bright man, a very, very good man. Um, came out of the Civil War, and he wound up first treating, working at a uh, hospital in New York City for inebriates. And he had, how many people know this, that the, the, uh, the hospital for, ineb for inebriates and broken down people was, was a homeopathic hospital that he ran. And he was so good at that that he was invited to, to form this, to, to head this other hospital in Middletown, New York, um, that was just being, being created, I think, in 1875. And uh, he had many, many skills as an administrator, as, 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 as a speaker. He was renowned as a speaker and just a really fine homeopath who trained with the, the best homeopaths there were. So he went there and he became, the, I think, the third superintendent of this, this hospital and he, with the, long, he had the longest tenure there. And he, he's got it on, on very solid ground. And the Middletown Asylum for the Insane, as it was called then, became the mother church for these other state-run asylums around the country. All the great homeopathic psychiatrists uh, came through there, did a rotation, and then they would become the heads of other institutions like in Westboro and Cincinnati. And, Cincinnati. and then when they played out, played out their careers there, then they opened the private sanitariums. But Selden Talcott was just, uh, well, what he did was he noticed, for example, base, baseball was very big in those days. It still is, of course. And um, many places, facilities had baseball fields nearby. And he noticed that when the, the people were playing baseball, the inmates would play baseball with the, with the staff in the hospital and, and some of the doctors, and they really enjoyed it. But not only that, the people, the inmates who weren't playing would come out and watch, completely transfixed. And Talcott took that seriously. He said, you know, and he noticed that people were a lot better, felt better, they were more functional, they were more relatable when they were watching baseball. So he created this powerhouse team there. This is how I got, kind of got interested in this. They had a funny name. They're called the Asylums. Can you imagine? And uh, he poached players from the local teams, and he built this powerhouse team that played major league teams and uh, drew huge crowds. So that was, was a little source of income to Talcott. And um, the, the Middletown Asylums were a famous team. 
one of their players wound up be going to the Baseball Hall of Fame. Um, uh, <laughs> anyway, but baseball is in, in Japan. It's 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 you know if if you want to be professional psychiatrist, you would never take something like this seriously. Oh, that's beneath us. What do you mean baseball for mental health? The Japanese have actually studied that. They have had uh, look you know actually with a, a rent, you know the controlled study you know took a population of people and those who watched baseball on a regular basis and those who didn't. They found you know not surprisingly you know, uh, a, a very significant improvement in people are watching it. It's a very absorbing game and a very existential game. And I, I kind of go in, go into that in, in my chapter. Uh, it's not a trivial thing, but I, my hat is off to Selden Talcott for recognizing that and, and paying attention to it. You know, he wasn't just trying to build a professional uh, profile for himself. <laughs> mm, yeah. Well, we're going to take a short break now. You're listening to What Is Going On. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and my guest today is author, publisher, and faculty member of the Ontario College of Homeopathic Medicine, Jerry Kentor. And we're discussing the shocking truths shared in his book, Sane Asylums, the success of homeopathy before psychiatry lost its mind, which revealed that homeopath homeopathy really can and has worked miracles, especially in the area of mental health. We'll be back with more in a few moments. Stay tuned. Om Times TV. Imagine becoming a super influencer. Reinvent yourself, invest in your brand, and then manifest your success with a robust, spheric approach. Om Times Media and Broadcasting offers a unique and multifaceted way to become the spiritual and conscious influencer you deserve to be by putting your message across our powerful platform with its proven record of integrity and excellence. Through our produced shows, Own Times offers the opportunity to become a social media TV personality, a radio show host, an Own Times magazine columnist, and a syndicated podcaster, all in one shot. By live streaming your show on Ohm Times TV and broadcasting it across the extensive Ohm Times radio and TV networks, you become more than a host. You become an ambassador and a force for positive change. Ohm Times, open yourself to the possibilities. Hello, I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, host of Ohm Times flagship radio show, What Is Going On? And as an author, editor, and 13 times book judge who's read thousands of books and interviewed hundreds of authors, I'm constantly asked what's really worth reading and what's not. So I created the No BS Spiritual Book Club to help you save time and money by picking the brains of discerning names who have walked this path before you. There's no catch, no fees, and no BS. Just an ever-growing library of 10 best spiritual book lists from some of your favourite authors and teachers, plus free book excerpts, audios and video interviews with people like Don Miguel Ruiz Jr., David G., Lee Harris, Mark Nepo and more. From well-known classics to hidden gems you've never heard of, it's the only no BS guide to the best spiritual books to enlighten your journey of self-discovery. So why not join the club, get inspired and save money? at the no BS spiritual book club.com. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. Welcome back. Jerry Cantor, you said earlier that um, if people want a quick fix, homeopathy is not for them. When you think about the number of people who are seeing a therapist, a counsellor, a psychiatrist, a psychologist, um, and they're seeing them for years, and they're talking and they're telling their story, um, they might just as well go to homeopathy. Probably it's quicker. <laughs> well, you know, a lot of what I have to do now is get people off their medications. used to be that when somebody would come to a homeopath and they weren't on these, these medications, we would talk about cures and we, we could... We could walk that talk. It would not be hard. 
Nowadays, people are, seem to be much sicker and they're more dependent on medications. I, I think I talk differently. I would say we have to gain, get some traction on the case and gradually wean you from these medications just to get back to baseline. So that's a hard, hard thing. Uh, people, if they don't have the wherewithal or the, or the will, they find that they're, they can't deal with the processing of the paling way of layers that happens with homeopathy. They, they, uh, they get defeated. They feel defeated and they go back. So managing the case is really very, you know, very hard, probably the most challenging thing. There was something I wanted to, to, to mention that I haven't done any of my podcasts around, around this. And I, I, I believe in advanced placement common sense. Uh, and I, there's something in my book that I, I don't think has not has been sufficiently emphasized, which is an example of what I would call advanced placement common sense. When I wrote Sane Asylums, I, it occurred to me that, my gosh, I really have to explain what is madness? What is, what is mental illness? Is, I mean, it's a gigantic question, especially you know, back in the 1800s, early 1900s. It was, it was viewed differently anyway. It's constantly changing. The terms that are used go coming in and out of fashion. Uh, things were terms like prior to schizophrenia, we had dementia precox and things like that. But what exactly is it? Uh, at the end of my book, I have something called the Compendium of Mental Illness Perspectives, which shows all the different, I mean, as many ways I can think of that mental illness can be looked at and, you know, what the heck it is. It's, it's not a simple thing and it's not a medical, con- it's not necessarily a medical condition even. Um, certainly people who are looking, you know, doing biopsies of the brain uh, you know, they're not going to find the cause for schizophrenia there. It's not going to happen. And the Chinese knew this anyway by locating many mental problems in the heart, actually, in, in their theory. But anyway, what I did, <laughs> I came up with my own de- definition of, of, uh, of mental illness, which is, again, according to my advanced placement common sense standard. Okay, let me just read this quick section here that the in the book. Prior to psychosis, an individual behaving unpredictably who seemed unreasonable and overly passionate would have been described as having lost his or her reason. So in place of either psychosis or loss of reason, I have this more common sense notion, compromise of reason. This is, this is what I would say, how I would like to define mental illness, as having your reason compromised. And there are three factors that go into the compromise of the reason. It's kind of a perfect storm of three conditions that has to happen. The first is that has to be some kind of debilitation either uh, due to either exhaustion or an inborn deficiency. And the inborn deficiency, um, that would be something congenital uh, in, in, the, um, in, the, in, the, in the legacy, in the person's genetic history. Um, everybody comes into the world with something like that. So it's both important and also kind of unimportant because there's nothing that can be done about that. The second, the second condition involves exaggeration of a pre-existing bias, meaning a narrowing of perspective taken to its extreme. All these, okay, that's that's what happens when the perspective becomes very narrowed. And the third thing that that is, creates the perfect storm is the effect of a fright or something to stymie uh, reactivity, something that's that freezes you in your tracks, and then something freezes in the person. Uh, and they become stuck. And this is why they, they people in, with mental health problems defeat their therapists all the time. They're stuck. But anyway, these three things, this is my, my, my common sense analysis of what uh, a mental illness condition is. It's very general, but it's also specific in that these, if I believe these three conditions will create the perfect storm, a, a sense of debilitation uh, due to exhaustion, um, an exaggeration of, a pre, of an existing bias, and a fright that, that brings things, that that uh, brings everything to a halt and, and c- concentrates it as altogether. So as a matter of fact, when it, um, one reason I came to this was that when people were brought to the, to the uh, mental hospitals, these, these greatest homeopathic asylums, the first thing that was done was to, they, they, would be, they would give them rest, you know, good nutrition, even well before the homeopathy. They'd give them a bath, they'd be cleaned, they'd be spoken to by, gently by these amazing nurses. I've got a chapter on Clara Barris who's a genius nurse who wrote this fantastic book on uh, nursing the insane, or well, probably the best holistic nursing book ever written. Uh, she worked with Selden Talcott in Middletown. But yeah, uh, people were given an opportunity to rest and to recuperate, and there was no time frame for how, how, how soon they had to be gotten out of there. Why would you do that anyway? People have such different types of traumas. Some people will be there, whether just a short amount of time, others will have to be there a number of years. It, it goes by the individual. Any case, you have to deal with the the debilitation that has put the, made them vulnerable 
to being frightened and the ex- circumstances of their trauma, which have forced to have narrowed their perspective and made them paranoid. And I even hate using a word like that. But anyway, the, t- the term that I prefer to use to schizophrenia or psychosis is compromise of reason. And it, it, requires, it involves a perfect storm of these three conditions, you know, coalescing in this particular person. If you believe that, if you buy that, then the, homie, the asylum approach makes a great deal of sense. And you, you would, of course, say this idea of medicating someone for that or pretending that it's a medical condition is nonsense. Mm. Yeah. Before we move on to discussing the emotional roots of chronic illness, um, tell us briefly what you feel should happen in the way that we manage mental health issues. <laughs> yeah, uh, people should start reading homeopathy books and visiting homeopaths and, 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 and getting acquainted with these common sense notions and realizing that their fear has been exploited by the medical profession so that uh, they just consume pharmaceuticals blindly. Uh, and uh, this, there has to be some way out of it. There's not going to be any instant way out of this, Sandy, any more than taking a drug for your anxiety is, is, a, you know, is really a useful thing to do. It's a big project. You've asked an enormous question. Um, because it, it involves, it requires a, tr- a, a big shift in perspective. Uh, people need to take responsibility for their lives. That's why I'm, I'm sort of hung up on the term existential now, because as we're going to get into that. This requires responsibility. Ex- the existential pr- perspective involves looking at things very squarely, you know, not trying to run away from, the, the, from, from trauma and death, and these possibilities, looking at things squarely and seeing how am I, how am I going to live my life? What's the meaning of my life and how can I enhance its meaning? And a big part of that, of course, is in chronic illness is, you know, before I, you, it's not, homeopathy will not provide an eraser to this. You, if you want an eraser, do not go to a homeopath. If you want to understand what your, what your disease is, what your illness is, that takes some work and some responsibility, but it's very, very rewarding. My first book, by the way, was Interpreting Chronic Illness, the Convergence of uh, mm. Traditional Chinese Medicine, Homeopathy, and Biomedicine. And this book uh, is, is actually a sequel to that. Um, so I think people, I can't, I can't I, if you have to be told that your life is meaningful and it matters that what, what's going on there, I mean, maybe it's too late. But pe- most people do have some point, some, some ideas. At some point in their life, they, they do take stock. They say, what's going on here? What is, what's, but making the connection between their illness, though, and what they're thinking about um, that's a big deal. People have to re- recognize that there's a reason, there's a connection there, and uh, it's worth investigating. It's always struck me that one of the things that we should be doing is taking the fear out of it, because everybody, everybody <laughs> is afraid. You know, the person who is being labelled psychotic or mad or crazy or, you know, mentally um, ill, The families, the people around them, the people who deal with them, everybody seems to be carrying some kind of fear that is paralyzing them before they even start. Yeah. 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 So in the, in the, in at Middletown Hospital, uh, Clara Barris, who was the nurse in charge of uh, educating the nurses, and she wrote this book, uh, Nursing the Insane. It's interesting. She, she's, I, I, I play her off against Clara, Clara Barton, who was the more famous Clara Barr from that time, who was the angel of the battlefield. But I think Clara Barris, who became a psychotherapist, um, re- 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 needs her due. Anyway, she taught the nurses to be respectful to the clients, to, to uh, the, the term that's also been, that's been discarded has been moral hygiene. So the nurses actually engaged with the clients about their fears uh, and what, what their concerns were. It wasn't this idea that, oh, this is a condition, I've got to eradicate it or erase it in some way, medicate your way. They, they heroically engaged with the clients and to the extent that they could, they could, they could uh, direct them to fruitful activities, letter writing, crafts, arts, they did that. You know, and she did all kinds of stuff. She had giggle classes. She got people to, in a circle and made, made them all laugh. And all kinds of things. But the, the respect for the clients, which was you know, a, 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 an elaboration of the moral care idea um, was very, very big. But the nurses had a huge responsibility. They weren't just wandering in and out and injecting people with stuff. They were very much engaged in, 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 in the psychiatry, uh, the psychiatric you know, practice there. But yeah, the fear is very, very big. We fear the mentally ill. Um, sometimes we, 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 we judge them as, as, uh, 
as terrorists or <laughs> you know, very dangerous. Um, many the mentally ill, Ill the mentally ill in Maine are, are not are not dangerous to others. But that 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 idea, oh, watch watch out on the subway, someone's some crazy person is going to push you onto the tracks. You know that does happen, but it's it's not the core of what the problem is here at all. Yeah. Well, in your book, The Emotional Roots of Chronic Illness, I mean, you're looking at um, homeopathy um, and how it can be uh, used directly with the subconscious mind. Yes, yes. So um, tell us more about that book. Sure. Um, so I, I, what I think I've done here is re, re, reinvent existential psychology from a homeopathic perspective. In existential psychology, which grew out of World War II and the quest for meaning for what was, you know, what what was all this about? The Holocaust, all these people dying. What <laughs> uh, what what's going on here? That that, that that's a, the expression of that is very 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 much in the in the here and now. So it doesn't go into the subconscious. It doesn't go into anything beyond the sense of taking responsibility, trying to find meaning. But what illness teaches us is that these existential issues uh, themes are buried in the subconscious. And they can be homeopathy can bring them to light, and uh, the body is constantly, you know, when when you have a chronic illness, the body is trying to commute its existential plight to you. Um, so, if you knew these things automatically, you you would we wouldn't be talking about the subconscious. It wouldn't be something buried. Anyway, so my book has identifies five core existential questions, and well, how this is different from what's in my first book is that these these questions. Um, express what on homeopathy called the five classical myasms. In other words, if you, can, if you flunk these questions, if you, if you cannot resolve the tension in the existential quandary, that sets the stage for tuberculosis or for cancer or for sora, uh, this is, which is one of the um, myasms, gonorrhea and syphilis. And I go, go through that in the book. And those, those myasms uh, represent the good and the bad uh, that is inherited in people as a result of having an ancestor who's who's had some of those condi- you know one of those conditions. Actually, we've all had all of those conditions we've, in in our background. But when they when they emerge powerfully in someone and express themselves in 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 a modern day chronic illness, then the homeopath has to figure out what that miasm is, become uh, engaged with the um, existential quandary that's there, and find the remedy that helps the person to process it. So I can, I'll just read you the name to tell you the names of the five, of the five quandaries. Unpacking that completely would be uh, impossible to do. That would require you reading the book, but um, here they are. So the first one is, uh, am I alone or do I act in synchrony with nature and with others? And in Chinese medicine, this pertains to the, the phase of fire. It, in, um, I'll say a little bit, it, it, it pertains to the circulatory system. It, it pertains to you'll see the connections if you read the book, to tuberculosis. The second one, which is Sora, um, this is, is my presence in the world sustainable? Am I okay in the world? Am I going to survive things? This pertains to metabolism. Um, in Chinese medicine, it's the earth element, and it's um, the, the, the base in Chinese medicine, they also talk about the spleen and the stomach. Um, the third one is, am I oriented in space and time? And this is the psychotic miasm, which relates to gonorrhea. You'd have to read the book to, if you're not familiar with these things to see how these connections play out. In Chinese medicine, this is the element of metal, and it pertains to uh, sadness and grief and identity, sense of identity. Uh, these all are connected dimensionally in, this, in my analysis. The fourth one is, can the boundary between life and death be abided? Now, this simply does not come up in existential psychiatry at all, uh, psychology at all. Because it has to do with our, our deep feelings about death, even when we're not aware of them. Somebody who's living, for example, uh, very profli- in, in, has, have a very profligate life. They just want glamour and sex and immediate gratification. They're not telling you that they have a problem with death. But in fact, what that means is that they're trying to escape that, to, to deny it, and to, be on the, on, to be, uh, you know, not deal with it. The flip side of that would be somebody who's deeply engaged with their legacy, feeling like you know, they're absolutely they're going to die. They're fine with it, but they're deeply concerned about legacy. What's going to come with after them if they if they if they're taking care of their 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 survivors? That's the other side of the of the very same quandary. And there are other remedies that come. come there are remedies that come into play for that. Um, the fifth one 
<laughs> you can have a favorite. This is my favorite. Um, is will the insurrection of my birth be fruitful? So not that everybody worries about this all the time, but at some point, maybe you think, you know, was did I make a difference in this life? Everyone's birth is an insurrection against the status quo, Sandy. World's going on perfectly fine. Now you come along. Uh, the world will make an impact on you, and you will make an impact on the world. Was is that fruitful? Um, this ties into in Chinese medicine the element of wood. Uh, it has to do with anger. An insurrection is already an angry, an angry state. Um, but you can lash out blindly and, and be very ineffective with anger, or you can convert it into creativity, which is uh, expressed in the Chinese medical system. And this relates to the ca the cancer miasm. And people, in fact, who are prone to cancer, at least as far as this goes, they are they have the problem, the existential problem of having not mounted a successful insurrection in their life. Everyone, in order to become a fully a full adult, must have a, a, a successful rebellion against their parents. I don't know how that flies in the conventional world psychologically, but I, I know that's true, and homeopaths do also. And over-accommodating the needs of others may make you a very f functional person, very popular person, but uh, the, when, you, when you encounter children who are highly perfectionistic or have anorexia and have had dominating, highly demanding parents, um, that is this particular, this same, this same, same miasm. They have sacrificed uh, their, their right to an insurrection for the sake of their parents or for the ecology of the family or something like that. Anyway, there's many, many variants of this. And I've broken down the remedies as subcategories of these five, uh, what I call existential questions, which are tied into the five classical mayas and, and into Chinese medicine. And this ex ex extends what I did in my first book. So if anyone's listening to this and um, feels that they would like to take it a bit further, I mean, is it common amongst homeopaths to have this knowledge and to be able to approach clients in, in the way that you're describing in this book? Well, I mean, I was trained in philosophy, so I like to be, I'm a little bit more syst systemic than most people, but most homeopaths who are well-trained have a passing acquaintance with this, they, and they pay a great deal of attention to the, uh, the mental and the emotional symptoms, and they have to, they have to uh, uh, use that as the, as the um, directing force for their prescription. Um, I, we, we all have some understanding of the miasms. Uh, there, it, that, that varies uh, from practitioner to practitioner, from school to school. So I'm, I'm just someone who's refining finding the organization of that, that, that kind of a, it's a kind of a cosmology. And because of my background in Chinese medicine, I have an advantage in expressing that maybe a little bit more um, eloquently than others. But mm -hmm. homeopaths are all trained to value what the, the, what's the, the mental and emotional picture. That's the, if, you, if you organize someone's symptoms on a pyramid, um, the, the very top of the pyramid is always the mental and the emotional symptoms. And if you look at Materia Medica uh, of, of the remedies, you'll see extensive section on the mind. So we value these peculiar little symptoms um, that uh, are a window into the psyche. You have to understand what, what you know, you, first day you'll find them quaint and interesting. You may say, well, that, that leads me to this remedy. But the more you practice, the more you get a sense of why that symptom, you know, is, is, is connected there. Uh, why does a woman who needs pulsatilla cry at the drop of a hat? Well, um, you can just give her the pulsatilla and not, not pay any attention to, to it. Or you'd, you go a little bit deeper and you realize, my God, being forsaken, being abandoned is a very, very big deal in this, in this person's life. It may have started very early on. Uh, and, and in consequence of that, her hormones are very dysregulated. Um, what else I can give you? Other symptoms? I mean, I mean, they'll give you some obvious ones. Uh, people who are terrified of public speaking, right? Absolutely terrified of public speaking. Um, they probably need a remedy like lycopodium, like which is a developmental remedy. Um, and the feeling is very political. They, they never got over the fact that um, there are other egos in the world and they're comparing themselves to other people. And, uh, interactions tend to feel like there's a winner and a loser. Um, is, this, is this something that we can treat ourselves easily with or safely? You can, I mean, homeopathy is very forgiving. You can, you, you can get a, a, an acute remedy kit, uh, 30 remedies or so, and, and treat yourself for all kinds of um, colds and flus and bee stings and uh, um, even anxiety with low potency remedies that are that are not difficult to identify. Helios, your pharmacy in England, has marvelous remedy kits like that. Yeah, they're fine. But 
at the at the higher level, it's it's very difficult for someone to prescribe for themselves. If you study homeopathy, you'll find, oh, I need that remedy. You need, you'll think you need every remedy that you learn about. <laughs> you need someone mm-hmm. else, basically, to to uh, even if you're really experienced, to to evaluate you. I I get it right for myself once in a while, but uh, I mean I'm really proud of it when I when I can because I really have to divide myself. Much better putting myself into someone else's hands. Similarly, with acupuncture, I can needle myself. I mean, there are all, all kinds of points I can reach. I can reach. It's not the same as getting someone else's energy when I'm lying on the table, you know, and giving myself over to that person. There's a transfer mm-hmm. of energy in the interaction. There's a transfer of energy when you put yourself in the hands of some of another homeopath as well. So, um, an amorphic field is created, even if the remedy may, may not be optimal. The fact that you connect with that practitioner and you're feeling he- heard. Something, something powerful goes on. Um, so there's that. Uh, I, I think it's not that expensive a thing to do. To, you know, it, it's something that there should be a lot more homeopaths around. The schools should be supported. They should not be undermined by the pharmaceutical industry's agenda and, or Johns Hopkins University. We need many more schools. We need a resurgence. We need people demanding more choice in mental health care, which would involve become getting gaining awareness of this fantastic form of medicine and not having it denigrated yeah it uh, there's so many things that could be done to improve the mental health of our of our, our species well before we close we've got a couple of minutes you are certified in um using a homeopathic isopathic approach to autism spectrum disorders what do you what can you actually treat um because you know people talk about behavior is the big one with when you talk about asd kids everybody assumes that their behavior is you know completely not normal it's a very deep problem autism uh that would require like several other shows i did write this book which involved which shows some cases that i've I've dealt with the the inherited the, the legacy issue there is very profound uh, it also reflects a lot of the toxicity in our environment and our medications. Um, it, does ref- it does reflect the impact of, of uh, irresponsible vaccinations. Many, many things play into that. Um, when I take a case like that, I work with a colleague. I, 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 there's just so much information to take in. And classical homeopathy, frankly, is insufficient uh, to, to treat it. It's not, that, is not, that is not a normal condition to treat. So we have to... Um, support the child with many other kinds of remedies and also nutritionally in the course of doing that, um, treating them. And this homeopathy is very powerful. In fact, it, this is the autism epidemic, which is supposedly came out of nowhere, uh, really gave a tremendous boost to homeopathic Amen. practitioners because no, nothing else worked. <laughs> there is nothing. Um, yeah, we have we have behavioral modification, but that doesn't go anywhere near to the, the origin of, of what this is. And as I say, the mar- origins are manifold. Many of them have to do with what, in, what I would call the, uh, the syphilitic miasm or that existential question of can the, can the boundary between life and death be abided? That's a deep question. So remedies from, from, that, from that miasm are always called into play. Um, but we have to use other supportive remedies, and we have to use remedies to reverse the toxic impact of various kinds of, 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 of medications and um, environmentally uh, toxic substances, you know, that are, that are, you know, like around what's used in like in Roundup, for example. Not everybody's affected by these things. You know, it's not like we're, we're all, everyone's equally affected. Some people are affected more than others. And so that's, that's how, that's why the individuality matters so much. I don't know if I'm sure if I answered your question, but uh, it's a hugely deep question. Oops. You there, Sandy? I think some things are frozen. Hello? Looks oh, like we had a, a technical hitch there, and I disappeared and you disappeared for a short while. But we are actually almost out of time now anyway. Um, We've probably got less than a minute left. Is there anything that you want to add before we close, Jerry? I'll say something very simple. Um, One of the basic characteristics of life is irritability. I learned this in junior high school, and I thought it was really funny when I learned it. Um, Well, acupuncture and Chinese medicine exploit the innate irritability of, of, of living things. 
Um, acupuncture is a mini, 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 mini stabbing. Big stabbing is not good, but a mini stabbing is, an, is an, uh, a provocation to the irritability of the organism that directs it to do what it wants to do anyway. Homeopathy is a mini, 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 mini poisoning. Big poisoning is bad, but a tiny poisoning exploits the irritability of the organism. And the healing takes place on the inside. The remedies and the acupuncture are not running over you with a steamroller. They're prompting something, a reaction in you that wants to happen. I will liken homeopathy to being a permission slip to the psyche to let go of the charge of an existential question. Um, this is, again, in the realm of what I call common sense, advanced placement common sense. But the paradigm difference is just so big. And when in the conventional world, we, we come up with more and more medications, more and more powerful medications. We have to deal with the side effects of that. It's a really bad road to go down. The, and the, on the opposite side, homeopathy, homeopathics are not even material. They are these permission slips to the psyche. psyche, to the, to the psyche. But, and the specific, their specificity is, so, is really very, very powerful. It, it wakes the psyche up. Say, oh, my God. That's exactly what I've been terrified of all this time, what I've, what I've given up on. Give me another chance. You revisit the scene of the crime. I've got to leave it there, Jerry. I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but give it another chance. It's good, it's good advice to leave on. Um, that's all we have time for, I'm afraid. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you so much for this interview, Sandy. Sane Asylums, the success of homeopathy before psychiatry lost its mind and the emotional roots of chronic illness, homeopathy for existential stress, are published by Healing Arts Press, a division of Inner Traditions Bear and Company. And for more information about Jerry's books and other resources that he offers, visit vitalforcehealthcare.com. That's it for this week. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer. I'll be back at the same time next week with another edition of What Is Going On. And if you want to download this as a podcast, um, you will find it on the Home Times website, on Spotify, iHeartRadio, and all the major podcast platforms. That's it. Thank you very much for joining us today. Till next week, goodbye from me, and thank you, Jerry Cantor. Thank you.